Assume we have a 2 cross 2 matrix A and a unit vector V, one which is shown using this dark blue vector. We know that if we multiply this vector V, one with matrix A and call it Y, one, then A will transform V, one into a new vector, Y, one, by either stretching it, squashing it, rotating it, or flipping it, depending on the entries of A. Look at this red vector, which is the transform vector, y1. Now, if we slowly rotate this vector v1, then every time it turns to a new direction, a will again transform it into a new output vector, or a new y1. As v1 goes around in a circle, the transformed vector y1 also moves around, but in its own unique pattern. Now suppose we're asked to find an orthogonal set of vectors, or in simple words, a set of vectors that are perpendicular to each other, that when transformed by A, will remain orthogonal. One way we can do this is by considering another vector, V2, which I will show using this blue color, such that it will be orthogonal or perpendicular to V1. Once we have these two perpendicular vectors, we can transform both of them using A and then check whether the transformed versions Y1 and Y2, which we will show using this maroon colored vector, still remain perpendicular. See when I rotate V1 and V2 together, the angle between Y1 and Y2 also changes. For the time being, let me hide V1 and V2 and only show the transformed vectors. We can clearly see that at this orientation, the angles between y1 and y2 is around 90 degrees, which means for this value of v1 and v2, both the transformed vectors or these are orthogonal. Similarly, at this orientation, the angles between y1 and y2 is again around 90 degrees, which means for these different sets of v1 and v2, both the transformed vectors or these are orthogonal. Keep them aside for a while. Now let us do some algebra and see some magic. We have these two equations with us, right? V1 and V2 are already unit vectors, but Y1 and Y2 are not. So we can represent it using some scalar value sigma, which acts as the magnitude and the unit vector U, which represents the direction. So Y1 equals sigma. 1 times u, 1, and y, 2, equals sigma, 2 times u, 2. For example, for this y, 1, its magnitude is this, and thus we get the unit vector u, 1, as this. And this will be sigma, 2, and u, 2, for this y, 2. Okay, great. Now we can rewrite this into matrix form like this, and then again split this part like this. So if we call this as matrix V, this as sigma matrix, and this as matrix U, then you can see that AV equals U times sigma. Okay, now multiply both sides by the inverse of V to get this. Since V is an orthogonal matrix, which means all the vectors in it are orthogonal, so we know that for an orthogonal matrix, V inverse is the same as V transpose. Therefore, we get A as U times sigma times V transpose. Now, using these two vectors, V will be this matrix, and thus V transpose will be this. Then using these two vectors, U matrix will be this. And then using sigma 1 and sigma 2 values, sigma matrix will be this. So, this A matrix can also be rewritten like this. We can see that each of these three pieces is doing a very simple job. This is what SVD is all about. There are multiple videos online which show how to find V, Sigma, and U, but we hardly find any that explain what these things mean in the first place. Okay, let me tell you two nice applications of SVD. First is it tells us in what direction does our matrix A stretch the unit vector V. The most you can see that as we rotate a unit vector v, the length of the transformed vector y keeps changing. Sometimes it becomes small, sometimes it becomes large, and at one special orientation it reaches its maximum value. 
This exact direction of V, where Y becomes the longest, is what SVD gives us directly. So mathematically, SVD solves this optimization problem where we are trying to find that one unit vector V, for which the length of A times V, becomes the largest. The direction that gives the biggest output length is exactly the first column of the matrix U, and that maximum stretch is the first value in the sigma matrix. Noise. SVD is used for image compression and denoising. It helps in reducing the dimensionality of image data by preserving the most significant singular values and discarding the rest. For example, look at the U, sigma, and V matrices for this 2 cross 3 A. We find that the last column of sigma is zero vector, and thus we simply discard the columns where the sigma values become zero because they do not contribute anything to the output. The remaining columns after that also get dropped in compression, keeping only the first few columns with the largest sigma values since they carry almost all the meaningful information. Look at the original image of this size and compare it with the version we get by keeping only the first k columns of sigma. As we increase k, the compressed image starts to look more and more like the original picture, while smaller values of k give a blurrier result, and larger values preserve finer details. But we don't actually need all of them, because most of the important structure of the image is already captured by the first few big sigma values. Isn't this super, super duper cool? If this video gets 10,000 likes, then in the next video, I will talk about another problem that can be solved using SVD which involves figuring out the directions in which the data spreads out. Finding these directions is what we call Principal Component Analysis, or PCA. By the way, let me know in the comments if you are aware of any other applications of SVD. So good!